Scripture, I wanted to let you know that I'm going to be introducing a, a couple of theological terms that maybe you're not that familiar with uh, this morning in the sermon and as we talk about uh, what happens today on the way to Jerusalem. You remember we're in this series about all of the things in, that Luke's gospel says Jesus did while he was on the way to Jerusalem. And each thing that Jesus does on the way to Jerusalem tells us something about the gospel. So two weeks ago, we talked about a costly commitment on the way to Jerusalem and how Jesus said, if anyone wants to come after me, he has to deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And then last week, we talked about ultimate urgency on the way to Jerusalem and how Jesus uh, taught people that there was only one way to heaven and that you needed to enter through this narrow door and that the time was short uh, for when we could make a decision. So ultimate urgency on the way to Jerusalem. And so this morning, we're going to look at grace given on the way to Jerusalem and to help us understand the two kinds of grace that Scripture talks about I wanted to talk about wedding china, okay? Uh, this may be a generational thing because I was in my nephew's wedding uh, in New Orleans this past weekend, which is a whole nother story. Uh, but uh, was at his wedding and we were trying to figure out, well, what are we going to get my nephew and his bride? And we noticed that in their registry, they didn't ask for any kind of china at all. So maybe this is a generational thing. But I want to ask you guys, uh, you guys that uh, are married, how many of you, uh, when you filled out your wedding registry, you had everyday china and you had fine china? Okay? Everyday china, fine china? Okay, some of you are all like, what? Uh, so let me just explain. We had, this is our everyday china. This is Aura by Falsegraph. And, uh, you know, or <laughs> sometimes our everyday china is great value by Walmart um, or styrofoam by Dixie. But uh, when we got married 25 years ago, our everyday pattern was Aura by Falsegraph. And so the idea behind everyday China is that this is the stuff that you use every day. Good. Thanks for playing. Uh, you know, anybody that comes to our house, we're going to serve them off of our everyday China. This is the stuff that, that uh, gets used for most of our meals, and this one even has a little chip in it because it's, it's been through it in the last 25 years. Not that the food that is served on our everyday china is anything less to be thankful for, unless I'm cooking, um, but this is the stuff that doesn't really have a special occasion to it. This is the stuff that we use every day. Now, over here... We have our fine china, and this is Greenbrier by Noritake. Uh, and I had to look because we don't pull this stuff out all that often, okay? This is the stuff that goes up in the top, uh, the top shelf, and we only pull it out for special occasions. We pull it out for our family. We pull it out when we want to remember a special event. Uh, oftentimes, the, if we have a meal at home on our anniversary, we'll pull out the, the wedding china. And the interesting thing is about this Greenbrier is that we got this on our wedding day. And we've never bought any more to go along with it. This was a one-time only gift. And it's not been added to. It's been taken away. We, had, we lost some in the move. Um, but it's never been added to. And so I say that to talk about the two uh, kinds of grace that we're going to be talking about in the sermon this morning. The idea of common grace and saving grace. Common grace and saving grace. I believe that we see both of them in the scripture passage this morning. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 17, 11 through 19, and as we've done the past couple of weeks, if you are physically able, I would invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. 
God's word says this. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, there's our key word, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, We're not all cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the perfection of your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. And Father, this morning, we humbly submit to your word. We thank you, God, that every single one of us is a recipient of your common everyday grace poured out on us because of your love for all people. And we thank you, Father, that many of us here have received your saving grace, which leads to salvation. And I pray, Father, that if there is anyone here that has not received that saving grace, that today would be the day. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. So before we talk about the difference between common grace and saving grace, I want to make sure all of us understand or on on the same page of what grace is to begin with. And this is so important that we understand what grace is. Is. So I don't want to take for granted that any of you just automatically know what it means. Years ago, I was in London, England on a mission trip. It was the spring of 2001 that I was in London on a mission trip. And we were in northern London talking to high school students. Northern London is a, is a center of the city for refugees, kind of like what we talked about Clarkston, Georgia. And so North London is home to lots and lots and lots of different people groups, people from Turkey, people from Syria, people from Iraq, people from Iran. High, high density of Muslim population in Northern London. And so I was talking to a Muslim teenager, and I asked him, I said, so In your mind, what do you think happens when we die? And this young man said to me, Well, you try to live a good life. And if Allah is merciful on the day you die, you will be welcomed into paradise. And I said, If. So you don't know for sure? He said, No, no one can know for sure. That would be arrogant. To believe that you could know whether or not Allah would be merciful on the day of your death. And I asked him, I said, do you know what grace is? And he said, oh yeah, I know what grace is. Grace is like when you're a really good dancer. Or when you can move really smoothly, people look at you and they say, oh, he has grace. And I said, So have you ever talked about grace at your mosque? Have you ever talked about grace when you talk about Allah? And he said, no. Why would we? I said, so you don't know for sure if Allah will be merciful on the day that you die. And he said, no. The only way you can know for sure if Allah will welcome you into paradise on the day of your death, is if you die for the faith. March 2001. Six months later was September 11th, 2001. Do you see why understanding grace matters? Grace is God's unmerited favor 
unmerited means that which you don't deserve. And so grace is God's unmerited favor, his goodness to the undeserving, and his divine assistance for our regeneration. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. That's grace. And so what is this common grace that we're talking about? Scripture says uh, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled the border uh, between Samaria and Galilee as he was going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And Jesus turned and healed all ten. So common grace is simply this. It is the sovereign grace of God bestowed on all people, regardless of whether they have or ever will have a relationship with him. Common grace is what God dispenses, what God pours out on the whole human race simply because he loves us, simply because he is a good, good father. In Psalm 145, 9, God's word says, The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Matthew 5, 45, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain, <laughs> we know all about that, he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In Luke 6, 35, Jesus uses the example of God's common grace to give us a clue as to how we should live. He says, love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the, great, to the ungrateful and to the wicked. So God dispenses common grace on the good and the evil, on the ungrateful, on the wicked, on the righteous. God causes the sun to rise. God causes the rain to fall. God causes the crops to grow because he loves all people. And he restrains evil in the world. Sometimes it doesn't seem like that. Sometimes it looks like evil is unrestrained in the world. But God restrains evil in the world and God withholds judgment on the world because of his common grace which is dispensed to all people. In Acts chapter 14 you have the story of Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas are on a missionary journey in the Greek city of Lystra and God has just used them to heal a man who had been lame since birth. And all the people in this pagan city of Lystra were amazed that the Holy Spirit had worked through Paul and Barnabas in this way, but they didn't realize it was the Holy Spirit. They thought that Paul and Barnabas were the Greek gods Zeus and Hermes come down from Mount Olympus to visit them. And when Paul and Barnabas realized what they were saying and realized that the people were trying to make sacrifices to them, they called out and they said, no, no, we are mere men. God is working through us. But look at how they used common grace to make a point to these pagans. He, they said in Acts chapter 14, verses 16 and 17, In the past, God let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. That means God has has given a message to these pagan nations. He hasn't, lived, he hasn't left them without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. See, just like the food that we eat on our everyday China is still a gift from God, it's still something to be thankful for. That's kind of what common grace is. All of these clues that God gives his creation and his people all over the world. That he is a good and loving father. And even non-Christians, even pagans can enjoy the blessings of a good life and love of family. That's common grace. But notice how Paul is using common grace to point the people in Lystra to something else. God has not left himself without testimony. The purpose of common grace is to point people towards saving grace. So what is saving grace? Saving grace is the grace which saves a person. 
right? The grace which saves a person resulting in their sanctification. Sanctification is another big theology word that just simply means the process that God uses, uh, uses to transform us more and more day by day into the image of his son Jesus. That's sanctification. But it begins with saving grace, that grace which saves somebody. Why do we need saving grace? Because we can't get there on our own. In Romans chapter 3, it says this, verse 10, As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have altogether become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. God's word consistently paints a very realistic picture of the human heart. He says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things, and who can understand it? The heart is a restless evil, it says in Proverbs. And so Romans tells us there's nobody that's righteous, not one, no one who does good on their own. All are deceitful, all have turned away. They have together become worthless. It is a grim picture of, huma of humanity until you get to this word, but now. But now. Two of the most powerful words in Scripture. But now. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Christ. So can common grace save somebody? Can just being thankful for the food on our plates and the air in our lungs, can that save somebody? No, it cannot. Saving grace is when we move from an acknowledgement that God is the giver of gifts to an acknowledgement that God gave his son Jesus to save us. That is when common grace moves to saving grace grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says it's by grace that we've been saved through faith, this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. Can we come to saving grace on our own? The answer is no. There's nothing that we can do to earn God's saving grace. There's nothing that we can do to even be aware of our need for saving grace. Scripture says we are dead in our transgressions. A dead person has no capacity on his own to respond to anything. And so when Jesus in John 11 says, Lazarus, come forth, Jesus brought the man back from the dead. And if we are ever going to respond to his saving grace, our dead spirit has to be awakened by God himself. Even the ability to respond to God comes from God. Hebrews 12 describes Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. So saving grace, faith in God, starts with Jesus as the author, and it finishes with him as the perfecter of our faith, the one who sanctifies us, who renews us day by day, and transforms us into the image of his Son. So I want to bring us in for a landing by kind of talking about how we see these two types of grace in the story of the ten lepers that were cleansed. And the first thing that we understand is that according to verses 11 through 14, grace doesn't have any borders. Grace doesn't have any borders. See, where were they when this story was told? They were traveling on the border between Samaria and Galilee. And you guys know, because we've talked about it before, that Jews and Samaritans didn't have a great relationship with one another. They kept themselves separate from one another. And so there's all kind of borders in this story. There's borders between Jew and Samaritan. And there's also borders between clean and unclean. Did you know that lepers were required uh, to stay? I got this from one of the commentaries. I thought it was fascinating. Lepers were 
were required to stay 50 yards upwind from clean people. So just imagine how fast they had to move if it was a windy day and the wind kept shifting. If they always had to be 50 yards upwind, you have this whole band of lepers that suddenly has to move just so they can stay upwind from the clean people. And so they would group together, and I think this is fascinating. The sick didn't have those borders. Bands of lepers were made up of Jew, Gentile, Samaritan, Greek. The only thing they had in common was their sickness. Tells you a lot about the people outside the walls of this church. They connect in their sickness, and that's what these lepers had done. Lepers were required to sew bells into their clothing so that you could hear them coming. And when they approached a town, they would have to ring the bells and they would have to call out, unclean, unclean, so that all the good clean people could scatter and stay out of their way. But Jesus broke down those borders. From the very beginning, it was God's plan that through Jesus, people from all nations, Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles, Greeks, people from all nations could be brought together through Jesus, could be reconciled to God through Jesus. God told Abraham way back in Genesis 26 that all nations would be blessed through his offspring. Galatians 3.28 says there's no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Revelation 7, 9 describes the scene in the throne room in heaven where there will be people from every tribe and every nation, every multitude gathered under heaven. It's going to look like Clarkston International Bible Church at the throne. Because all borders will be broken down. Jesus and his grace knows no borders. Amen. That's worth an amen. Thank you. I've never asked for an amen before, but I felt like I needed to there. Jesus' grace crosses borders. And that's what happens here. Jesus looked at these ten lepers and just said, All of you, you're healed. Common grace. Doesn't matter whether you're in the family or not. Just go show yourself to the priest. Grace doesn't have any borders. Number two, Jesus doesn't need any middleman. Let me show you where I got this. When he said to them, when he saw them, this is verse 14, Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. According to Leviticus 14.3, a priest had to examine someone who was cleansed of leprosy. So that's why Jesus told them to show themselves to the priests. Isn't it interesting that the command came first, they obeyed, and on the way they were cleansed. They obeyed, and then the healing came. It doesn't say that uh, they were cleansed and then they got up and left. But what's even more interesting is what this one leper did. Because in in verse 15 it says, One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back never went to the priest, broke the Old Testament law that said you had to show yourself to a priest. Why? Because there was already a priest there. Because Jesus, the great high priest, was already there. And this is an incredible picture of the new relationship that we have Now that Jesus has come, we have direct access to God the Father through Jesus, the great high priest. We no longer have to go to the old priest, to the old sacrificial system that ruled in the book of Leviticus. Hebrews 4 calls Jesus our great high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he's been tempted in every way that we are, yet is without sin. And Hebrews 4 says that as a result we can approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that we can receive mercy in our time of need. Jesus is our great high priest. He lived a perfect life just like our lives, only without sin. Jesus experienced all of the pain of growing up. Jesus was a teenager. He gets it. Yet he never sinned. And so we now have access to the ruler and creator of the universe who lived a human life just like ours. We don't need a middleman. We have direct access. 1 Timothy 2, 
5 and 6 says, There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. And this has now been witnessed at the proper time. So grace doesn't know any borders. And uh, number two, Jesus doesn't need any middleman. Number three, gratitude doesn't show any restraint. Verses 16 and 17. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. This leper who returned to give thanks is a great example of just unrestrained thankfulness. He wasn't supposed to touch Jesus. Jews and Samaritans aren't supposed to have any, any connections. Clean and unclean aren't supposed to be in contact with anyone else. But he, he removed the restraining order that said he had to be 50 yards away. And he comes and he falls at Jesus' feet. And you know what? When Jesus invades our lives... We don't hold back, or at least we shouldn't. Sometimes we do, don't we? But when Jesus invades our lives, there's no holding back. You see this in 2 Samuel 6, when David danced before the Ark of the Covenant, and his wife made fun of him and says, how you have distinguished yourselves among the slave girls, disrobing as any vulgar fellow would. And, Jesus, and, and David said, it was before the Lord that I danced, and I will become even more undignified in my praise and my thanksgiving to my God. Unrestrained gratitude. When Mary broke the alabaster jar of perfume over Jesus' feet and wiped her, his feet with her hair. Unrestrained gratitude. What keeps us from showing unrestrained gratitude? What keeps us from falling at Jesus' feet? What keeps us from responding to the gift that he gives us? What keeps us from settling? What, what, what keeps us settling for just common grace when Jesus offers us saving grace? You ever wonder what happened to the other nine lepers? I did a few years ago. I was... Uh, getting ready to preach this passage. And I came up with a poem. And I've revised that poem every time I preach this and added some different stuff. And so I want to share this poem with you if you'll indulge me for just a minute. Ten lepers walked the city streets and stopped to hear the preacher preach. So close to death, all pride was stripped, nothing to lose, so those with lips called, Jesus, help us out a bit. Go show yourself to the priest, he said. They scattered west to east. Their skin with cleansing fire burned. Ten lepers left, but one returned. Once the question came to mind, what happened to the other nine? And though I claim no revelation, this is nothing more than speculation, I offer you this testament of where the other lepers went. First, there's leper number one, who took off in an all-out run, his feet, now free from open sores, ran like they'd never run before. Poor old leper number two had no idea what he should do. So scarred from years of being shunned, went home, locked up, and saw no one. Then there's leper number three, for whom sickness became security. For years defined by leprosy till it became identity, healed, became a bitter man, and wished he could get sick again. That accounts for three who were healed that day. Nine lepers left, one leper stayed. Leper four, his skin free of spots, left and immediately forgot he'd ever been a leper. Five and six found love along the way, ran off, got married that same day. So that makes six accounted for. One leper stayed, that leaves three more. And of those three, there were the two who wrote life from a leper's point of view. They gained great fame in lecture halls, signed copies of their books in malls, and on the Oprah Winfrey show, Oprah said, We want to know, to what do you attribute health? From within, they said, we healed ourselves. Number nine believed his leprosy was to be replaced with prosperity. Convinced it's what he deserves somehow, he's out there living his best life now. So ten lepers went their separate ways. Nine lepers left, one leper stayed. One leper stayed. 
He stayed to fall at Jesus' feet, stayed to feel his touch so sweet, to thank him for the gift he gave. Ten lepers cured, one leper saved. Salvation requires a response. The tenth leper shows the difference between common grace, which is given to all ten lepers, regardless of whether or not they ever respond to him, and saving grace. I want you to notice what Jesus said to the one who came back. Verse 19, Jesus says to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. In the Greek, the word for made you well is sozo. It's used interchangeably in the New Testament, sometimes referring to physical healing, sometimes referring to spiritual salvation. For example, in Matthew 1.21, when the angel tells Joseph what they are to name the baby boy, he says, you call, shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people, sozo, from their sins. It's the same word that's used in Luke 17.19. Now you might say, well, if the words can be used interchangeably, then you can't make a whole theological point just on this word, and you're right. But it's worth noting that there's lots of words for physical healing that Jesus could have used, but he didn't. In verse 17, for example, when Jesus is talking about the other nine, he says, we're not all ten cleansed. That word that he uses there is the Greek word katarizo, it's where we get our word catharsis, a cleansing something. We're not all ten katharizos. In John 5, when he heals the paralytic at the pool, he says, I see you are well again. And the word he uses for well is hygias. It's where we get our word hygiene. In Matthew's gospel, when Jesus heals the sick, the word is therapuo. You can guess what word we get from there, therapy. So Jesus had a pretty extensive vocabulary that he could have used. He could have said uh, catharsis. He could have said uh, healed. He could have said therapy. He could have said hygiene, clean. Instead, he says sozo, rise and go. Your faith has saved you. I think when someone responds to the grace that's poured out to them, saving grace becomes I mean, common grace becomes saving grace. Everyday China <laughs> becomes wedding China. And the moment of response is the moment of salvation. John 1.12 says, To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, not everybody is a child of God. No matter what we are the world says, we are not a part of God's great big family until the moment of salvation. Then, then, we become a child of God. How do we do that? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I think that the one leper that came back moved from common grace to saving grace because he confessed with his mouth, Jesus is Lord. I think that's what happens. I gave you one definition of grace at the beginning of this message. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Let me give you another one. It's real easy to remember. What is grace? Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem when he met ten lepers. What happened when he got to Jerusalem? He went up that Via Dolorosa that Amy sang about. He went up that way of sorrows. And he was beaten every step of the way. And he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, it says in Isaiah 53. The punishment that brought us peace is upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's shed blood. God's riches at Christ's 
thorn-scarred brow. God poured out his grace on all people, and he continues to pour out his grace on all people. That's common, everyday grace. But when you recognize the giver of those gifts, and when you turn and we, you fall at his feet and you say, thank you, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Common grace that's given to all people becomes saving grace, which is poured out for you. And I wonder if you have responded to God's saving grace. I wonder if you have moved from everyday gratitude to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this morning, you have an opportunity to. This morning, you can move from common grace to saving grace simply by doing what Romans 10 says to do. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and the promise is that you will be saved. I want to give you a chance to do that. Would you bow your heads and pray? Father God, I thank you for the story of the ten lepers. And I thank you that maybe, just maybe, this morning, there's one leper who's ready to come and fall at your feet. And God, if that is so, I pray that right now in this moment, that you would move. If you teach us something, we promise to listen. If you tell us to do something, we promise to obey. And I pray, Father, that right now, today, would be the day of salvation for one leper in this room. Somebody that realizes that you've reached out to them and you've offered them salvation. Would you give them the courage to respond in this moment? In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand.